and welcome to mini episode 270 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And I have one spooky story for you today. And the story comes from the 19th of February 2023. And today's story comes from Megan. My two older brothers, Francis and Edward, and I grew up in the southern countryside of Canada's capital city, Ottawa, from the early 1990s to the late 2010s. I don't live in this area anymore as our family home was sold last year to a lovely expecting couple. My parents were among the first to occupy Forest Green Crescent in 1989, where the land was large, serene and very quiet. If I were to yell as loud as I could from my yard, only the lots beside us could barely hear. It was that thick. It was the best area a kid could be raised in as the dense forests and lush marshes were a focal point for our imaginary playtimes and childish exploration. Us kids were allowed to leave on our own at the stroke of dawn and stay out until bedtime. It was complete freedom and I will always be thankful to my parents for giving us such a privilege as it blossomed a deep love for nature in Francis Edward and I. Such as its name, Forest Green Crescent was, surprise, shaped like a wavy crescent, and nearly every part of its edge was inhabited by a kind family or elderly retired couple. But the exception to this was a large swamp that occupied the hump of the crescent, marking the halfway point of the street. As beautiful as it was, this swamp had no name and was owned by one of the neighbours that lived beside it. They were a good family that we knew personally, as the wife was a secretary at our local high school. She allowed all the children on the street to explore the swamp as they wished, so long as they followed one rule. Never go alone. This was mostly due to the swamp's deep waters and precarious grass hills, where one wrong step could trap your leg in an animal's underground hutch. However, today I wonder if she knew what kind of secrets the swamp was actually hiding. Back then, nothing was going to stop us from exploring. The swamp was a thriving ecosystem, abundant with all sorts of flora and fauna. I recall many happy summer days where Francis Edward and I would wade through the brush in our rubber boots to spy on beavers, painted turtles and nesting great blue herons. We loved to catch leopard frogs and spotted salamanders and chase muskrats into the shallows. On hotter days, the chorus of cicadas and Canadian geese was so loud. But the fun didn't end in the summer. Over the cold Canadian winters, the swamp would freeze over and the landowners would clear a spot for skating and ice hockey. When the ice was thick enough, the swamp could also be used as a snowmobile path into the surrounding forest. We would often follow these trails into the thicket at the back of the swamp to search around the areas we could not reach during the warm season. This was an especially great treat, as the swamp's forest contained many wooden structures made by early settlers of the early 1900s. They were very decrepit and falling at the hinges, but nevertheless, they were fun to explore during the winters when we could reach them. One had a sign advertising a shoe cobbler, Others had been cabins that contained the remains of a wooden bed frame and tables. Some nights, my parents would take the boys and I for a walk on the frozen swamp to watch the stars. That would inspire some of my favourite treks through the grounds, as the cold air, abandoned cabins and unmatched silence of the night made for a tantalisingly spooky setting. It made my heart race and my imagination run wild, but I always felt safe so long as I was with Francis and Edward. This is where I should mention that my brothers and I did not share the friendliest of relationships as children. When we were stuck inside the house, we would fight often and things could get physical. Francis and I have a six-year age gap and I was often the butt of his antics and Edward, being the middle child, often tagging in on them. There were many times where we got so frustrated that Francis and Edward would push me out of the house and lock all the doors with no way for me to get back in. This would be a big factor in what happened to me on a dark and cold night inside the swamp's forest. One winter evening, my parents had a business party to attend. My brothers and I were fighting over what we should make for dinner before being kicked out of the house by our folks as they got tired of our endless yelling. 
They dressed us in our thick winter coats, boots and snow pants and told us to spend some time outside to cool our heads while they went to the car and drove off. We decided to walk down the crescent and take a stroll over the frozen swamp and into the trees. We did our usual routine and explored the abandoned buildings. During the middle winter, the sun sets very early at around 4pm, so it became very dark very fast. After a couple of hours, we were freezing our butts off in the minus 20 degree temperature and ready to go home. However, the tension between us was thick and we were still frustrated with each other from our early fight. So Francis and Edward thought that they would teach me a lesson. Now, before delving further, I should preface that I do not blame my older brothers for what happened that night. We were all under the age of 15 at the time and had zero forethought for our actions. While this was a very dangerous and cruel prank, they've since apologised and I have forgiven them. And in their defence at the time, the three of us did not believe in ghosts. While walking back towards the swamp, Francis and Edward decided to drag me to one of the abandoned structures and throw me into an outhouse constructed inside for the snowmobilists. They slammed the wooden door and somehow managed to get it to hold firm, as there was no way I could kick it open. I became stuck between four wooden walls where my arms could barely stretch out and no light from the moon or the stars could reach. It was small, stinky, dark and very cold. I heard my brothers mutter that they would be back to retrieve me later and then I heard them walk away, leaving me all alone. Because of our past antics, I had grown to become very claustrophobic, having been trapped in sleeping bags and boxes by my bigger and stronger brothers. I've gotten over the phobia as an adult, but back then, if I could not stretch out my legs or my arms in a space, I would quickly start to panic. I was frantic and began to lose control of my breathing, calling out for my brothers to cut it out and come back and get me. As the temperature continued to drop, my tears and snot froze to my face. I was shivering horribly and struggling to bundle myself inward to preserve my body heat. It felt almost unnatural how quickly the cold set in, like a polar vortex one would only see in the later parts of the season. I was absolutely freezing and crying so hard that I was struggling to inhale the dry winter air. All I could hear was the ringing of my ears and my own sobs. But it was not long before I began to hear something else. Remember, we were all prepubescent at this time. So when I heard the screams of a grown man cry out from the dark surrounding the outhouse, I knew that I was still alone. His yells were shrill and desperate as if in horrible pain. Sometimes they were distant, other times it was as if you were inside the outhouse with me. It was horrifying, and I held my breath as to not make a sound, terrified that he would come for me. Quickly following this man came an older woman, also crying out in terror throughout the forest. Her voice was racked with sobs like a grieving mother who had lost a young child. She and the man wailed and wailed. Then more voices began to join them. It was so loud, a cacophony of shouts, whoops and cries, like an endless mob of desperate victims trying to escape some great danger. I squeezed my eyes closed and covered my ears, praying to God that they would leave and not hurt me, but it was almost endless. Sometimes there were brief pauses of silence before one of the voices cried out again, triggering all the other voices to begin another round of hysterical yelling. As time went on, I could swear that these cries were becoming desperate and angry, shouting profanities and phrases like, Where are you? Please help me. But for the most part, it was just screaming, nonsensical and deafening. After what turned out to be hours, I finally heard the shouting of Francis and Edward through the terrible screams of these disembodied beings. They were calling my name. Megan? Megan, where are you? They sounded so scared and I eventually found the bravery to call out in return, begging them to find me. I heard footsteps approach the outhouse and then a heavy banging rattle the door. 
I'm not ashamed to admit that I wet my snowsuit because I thought that the voices had finally come to get me. But when the door swung open, I was relieved to see my brothers, just as tear-stained and terrified as I was. I ran out of the outhouse and into Francis's arms, begging him to take us home. When I could finally see the moon through the tree branches, it was then that the voices finally stopped, and the three of us looked around in alarm. But there was still nobody there. We ran the entire way home, through the forest, across the swamp and down the crescent, slamming the door behind us when we got into the mudroom. We were exhausted and so relieved, stripping our winter clothes and running to our parents' ensuite to start a bath. We weren't even embarrassed to bathe together, we were just that desperate not to be alone. At the time, I had no clue how long my brothers left me in that damned outhouse. It was not until I looked at the clock in the bathroom that I realised we'd been out for three hours and that our parents would be home in a couple of minutes. As we got warmed up in the steaming water, my brothers confirmed that while they were sitting on the swamp and looking at the stars, they too had heard the screams from the forest and ran back into the trees to come and get me. But to their shock, they could not find the outhouse anywhere. This was strange as the abandoned structures were less than 100 metres from the tree line and should be easy to spot. But to Edward and Francis's eyes, they were nowhere in sight. They had just disappeared. After wandering about trying to find me through the yelling, they became desperate and tried to run out of the forest to go get our neighbours for help. But then they quickly became lost. We had explored the area so many times, so it made no sense that they could not find their way out. And the entire time they were surrounded by the screams and clung to each other as they tried to find their way back to the swamp, calling my name the entire time. I was sad, but also relieved that I was not the only one who had heard these voices. But I was also horrified that I had just disappeared out of nowhere. Perhaps it was when I finally found the courage to cry out for my brothers that the structures reappeared or maybe it was just dumb luck. But I was so glad that we had made it out okay. After that night, the three of us never went past the swamp after dark ever again. My brothers would still explore the structures and the forest together but never after 4pm. Not wanting to risk it, I wouldn't wander into the swamp again until I was 17 years old. While celebrating a friend's birthday at my house, the five of us decided to go for a late night walk in the snow where they requested that I take them across the swamp I'd been so fond of. I had never told anyone what had happened that night when my brothers and I were children and I was still in denial of what we experienced. I took a leap of bravery and led my friends across the ice and into the forest but I refused to go past the tree line. Those old structures were still there much more broken than they had been all those years ago, and my friends enjoyed themselves as they explored with wonder in their eyes. When we were all ready to leave, I took one look back into the dark forest. I sucked all of my breath into my lungs and bellowed out the loudest yell I could, echoing through the frozen trees. My friends were stunned, but playing along, they too yelled into the forest as loud as they could, all of us laughing hysterically afterwards. Today the landowners have since sold the swamp to retail developers. They have drained much of the swamp and built two new plots for houses along the road where the brush used to be. To this day I still don't believe in ghosts, but I am flexible to the idea that objects and places can have an energy linked to them, something that people can latch on to in times of weakness and panic, triggering a group hysteria. I have no clue if those abandoned structures still stand after all these years, but for the sake of any children who move into those new homes, I hope they've wasted away for good. Megan, what a story you have blessed us with today. That childhood sounds completely idyllic to me, running wild and free from morning to night, out in the wilderness, out in the wild, running around, spotting turtles and herons and all beautiful bits of nature. I mean, it just sounds dreamy. And then in the winter to be able to spend your time ice skating and playing ice hockey and oh, just stunning really. I mean, aside from being traumatised by your brothers, 
which I think really is a rite of passage when you've got older brothers. They're they're born to traumatise you, to terrorise you. It's just the way it is. The idea of you being locked in that outhouse made me think of the scene in Sixth Sense where he's locked in the cupboard by the other kids who are really mean to him and he's like freaked out and then he comes out all injured out of the cupboard because he's after being battered by a ghost. And what you describe sounds absolutely traumatising to even hearing a man screaming in pain and anguish out in the forest when you're in a really vulnerable position where you're locked in an outhouse and you can't get out and you've nowhere to escape to sounds absolutely petrifying and then for it to kind of build to a cacophony of sounds of like panicked people and angry people searching and looking and looking for help and and maybe you're right maybe it is this case of there's a particular energy attached to the place and your fear and panic and pain triggered something to happen and similarly your brothers were then equally panicked because they couldn't find the outhouse and as a result they couldn't find you so was it a case of like the perfect type of energy being released into the atmosphere and caused a replay of all of these feelings this this forgotten event that that had happened on that land so it kind of reminds me of and I promise you this is going somewhere um the other day I was sitting in my sitting room with some friends and my friend Cass turned to me and said have you got like a a bubble machine in your courtyard And I was like, no, what are you talking about? And I have this tiny, tiny little courtyard out the back of my house. And there were just thousands and thousands and thousands of flying ants just erupting from the slabs in the courtyard and taken off into the air. And it honestly was like a plague. It was biblical. It was one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. And I didn't know there was such a thing as like flying ant day. And basically, it's when the air temperature, the humidity, the pressure is perfect and it triggers these ants to take off and fly and find new colonies. But obviously, they have to wait for this perfect temperature, pressure, etc. to trigger them, right? Now, I was standing at my back door looking at all these ants everywhere, all over my courtyard in horror, thinking, well, I'm just going to have to burn the house down and move on because I can't possibly live here. I'm not sharing my house with a million ants. It's not happening. But they just sort of took off and they were gone and now I've no more ants left. However, however, my point in that rambling tangent is this. What if it was the perfect energy, the perfect feelings of fear and terror and pain being released into the atmosphere that triggered this supernatural event? I'm sorry, but did I just solve science? I think I did. I would love to know, Megan, as well, if there were any kind of significant events on the land like relating to maybe somebody going missing I'm trying to think what scenarios would cause people to all be out shouting and looking for help where you know were were there people that um, perished on the land I would love to know if that that screaming in the forest was like an echoing through time of some sort of long forgotten event Thank you so much to Megan for sending in their story. And remember, Megan's story came from the 19th of February, 2023. And if you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can sign up to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. <laughs>